Come on. Come on. Come on. Shall we? Okay, hi everyone. Hello. Um, thank you so much for coming along today. It's really nice to see so many of you here. Uh, this is the We Are All Global Talk. Hopefully you're all in the right place. Well done, you've made it here. First day of UCL. Um, and this is the start of the International Student Orientation Programme. Um, we will be comparing you throughout the day. We have lots of practical information to give you. Uh, my name is Claire and I work here at UCL in the study abroad team. So helping UCL students go abroad as part of their UCL degree programme. And my name is Diana and I work with Claire as well in the study abroad team. I'm a global experience coordinator and I help students go abroad on short term programmes. Brilliant. So, um, we firstly, I mean, we, obviously we are a little bit biased here, but we do think that you've made a really fantastic choice in coming to UCL. So a big congratulations to you for that. It's a very wise decision. Um, and we also just wanted to ask you to congratulate yourselves on your first day here. So welcome. Um, just a couple of housekeeping bits, a few boring bits before we get going. Um, we're not expecting any kind of fire alarm today, no fire drill, so if it goes off, it's the real deal, and we'll need to get out fairly quickly. Um, you can see in a kind of aeroplane style that there are a number of fire exits around the room, so if the alarm goes off, make your way out as quickly as possible. Um, if you have any uh, issues with your mobility or accessibility, just grab one of our colleagues in the blue t-shirts and they can help you. Um, what else do I need to tell you? Toilets, if you need a, a quick toilet trip, they're just outside the door here. Uh, please make sure that you keep all of your valuables with you today. As you can see, we've got a really big audience and a fairly big open space. So do make sure that you keep your bags with you. Um, and we'd be very grateful if you can take all of your litter with you at the end. It saves us a job at the end of the day. Um, you also should have been given a sheet when you came in. This will give you information about the Wi-Fi and just some practical information about today. Um, and on the back, there is a quiz sheet and all will be revealed later for that. Right, so just a few words on the schedule for the week. Um, you would have all received the pre-enrollment email with all these details. So make sure that you go uh, back to that email and read through what's going on. Um, so today we're having the We Are All Global Talks, which is we, what you're attending at the moment. We really hope that you you're aware of that. Um, tomorrow, um, you have your enrollment appointment, so um, make sure that you've signed up for that and attend um, your enrollment at uh, the time that you've signed up for. Um, and then throughout the week, we have a student's union events, so um, they are running a set of breakfast events, workshops, a game, uh, games night, uh, boat party, and many more. Um, and also throughout the week, you'll have the opportunity to do a campus tour or a library induction as well. Brilliant. Yeah, so lots of stuff going on this week. Hope you are prepared and ready to go for it. Um, so the schedule for today, as I mentioned, we've got lots of information to get through today, lots of uh, info that we want to give you, and also lots of speakers to welcome to the stage. So the first half of today's session will be officially welcoming you to UCL um, and giving you lots of information on what life is like as a student here at UCL. We will then have a very short break in the middle just for a chance for you to kind of stretch your legs um, and we'll then begin session two where we will uh, speak with our global ambassadors, we'll have a Q&A panel um, and we'll also give you lots of practical information about living in London. Um, yeah, here we go. Right, so just a quick reminder, if you haven't done this already, please download our Welcome to UCL app. Um, this has a set of useful guides about life at UCL. Um, and that will help you with your induction throughout um, the following weeks. Um, and also, um, you can um, view all the Students' Union events and you can make a sort of personal, personalised uh, schedule for yourself. So make sure you download that um, if you haven't done it already. Brilliant. Okay, so without further ado, we would like to introduce our first speaker to the stage to officially welcome you to UCL today, uh, is Catherine Carruthers, who is UCL's Pro Vice Provost for East Asia. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. 
Nice to meet you all. There's a lot of you to meet, but um, at least you'll be able to recognise me by the end of the day, even if I can't recognise every face. But I'm Catherine Carruthers, and as they said, um, I'm the Pro Vice Provost for East Asia, which means supporting the university in looking after the very many partnerships that UCL has with universities in China, Japan, Korea and Taiwan. So that's a, quite a busy part of my role. But I also work here at the Institute of Education, which is a great example of brutalist architecture, for those of you interested in architecture. Um, it was described by somebody who's quite into brutalism as a glorious hulk of a building. So think of it like that, glorious hunk of a building. Um, but alongside the Pro Vice Provost role, I also work here, but not actually in this building, but in a little building nearby, um, on the teaching, um, developing the teaching of Chinese in schools and researching into it. So I am a Chinese speaker, and I guess I could say in Chinese, 各位学生, uh, 大家好, 欢迎你们来, you see our Dash with Shi. Well, that's, that's easy claps, isn't it? Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'll do a bit more of that. And, uh, but if I, want, if I convey anything this afternoon, I really want to convey my sense of excitement as well and to really add my congratulations. It's really exciting to be here and, and, and to meet you at the start of your life here. You've done really well to get here. It's not easy to get a place. So congratulations to you from me as well as to, from our um, compares at the beginning of this afternoon. Um, uh, but also... What I like about doing this talk is it gives me the opportunity to talk about UCL and boast about UCL to a very receptive audience, because normally, you know, there's been lots of good things there about UCL all the time, but when you're in very serious meetings for other universities, you can't endlessly boast about yourself, but this afternoon you can. So I want to talk a bit about UCL to make you, to remind you, if you need a reminding, which I'm sure you didn't, that you've made the best choice coming here um, to study for your undergraduate career. So, firstly, I would say that UCL's big, um, 42,100 students, that's a lot of students, and sometimes if you're late for a lecture, it'll feel like a lot because you can't get through the crowds, but what it does, what it really does, is enable this great university to make an impact. Um, and just one little example, a couple of days ago, because they start a bit earlier than you, I was in this hall which was packed with postgraduate students who are doing a one-year course here at the Institute of Education training to be teachers, secondary school teachers, for schools across London. And that is amazing. So you've got 800 people in here, all trained to be teachers. So we can, from UCL, make a difference um, because of the size as well as, obviously, the academic excellence. Um, we're also, as you will have realised, a really global university. It's London's global university in the heart of Bloomsbury. We've got students and staff coming from about 155 different countries, which is a lot of countries, and it means that you've decided to come here to enhance your global perspective, your global view of your chosen field, but also, clearly, by coming here, you're enriching immensely um, our university and contribution to academic uh, endeavour here at UCL. Just at this point, I did want to mention UCL's Global Citizenship Programme, which you'll have a chance to participate in later in the year if you want to, um, when it's an opportunity for students and undergraduates across UCL to take part in thinking about real global issues, how they could be addressed through research, and what you, actions you could take as a citizen. So they're sort of two-week projects that people work together um, across UCL, and that comes later in the year. So you'll find out about that. But now, just talking a few minutes about UCL per se. So clearly you'll all know, I guess, but I won't going to quiz you. I'll just tell you again that we were founded in 1826. We were the first university to take students irrespective of religion or social background. We were, in 1878, the first university to take um, women on equal terms with men, which obviously it took us a while to sort it out, but we did, so we were the first. And um, our founding principles, which I think is important, which were ones of academic excellence and addressing real-world problems, they, you know, they continue, obviously, to be fundamentally important to what we do um, still today. 
So we're in the, in the world top 10. We're actually, we're eighth in the QS World University rankings of 2020, so that's pretty good. Fourth in Europe, first in London, and clearly, I can't actually remember the names of any of the competitors, so I don't need to mention them here. <laughs> <laughs> but we do really, really well in research. We were top of the, um, in the UK for research strength in the 2014 Research Excellence Framework, and we were proud, very proud to gain a silver award in 2017 for our, the first round of the Teaching Excellence Framework. So about, just a little bit about research. You'll hear people talk about this word, UCL Grand Challenges. I mean, it's just trying to sort of focus you on this real world idea. So we have these grand challenges, which tend to get bandied about quite a lot as terms, but they are exciting. They're thinking about how we, as a university, and researchers and students, can work together around helping to find solutions for real world problems. So the grand challenges are six areas of pressing concern. They are global health, cultural understanding, sustainable cities, um, and I always forget a few, so human well-being, justice and equality, and transformative technology. So a lot of our cross-curricular search is centred around those themes. And actually, research is part of your time at UCL. You may be undergraduates. But what UCL's educational framework is based on is a connected curriculum. So UCL aims to offer an even richer and more re rewarding education experience by engaging all students, all students, in research and inquiry, exposing all students to the very latest knowledge and thinking, and changing a bit the nature of the dialogue between staff and students to become one of partnership. So I think that's quite exciting. Something we're still working through, but it's, you'll be very much part of that. Doing for time. I'm all right for time. I don't want to keep on time. Um, so thinking a little bit more about the, this idea of excellence, there's been 29 um, Nobel Prize winners at UCL so far. Uh, there's a, the list, I was just revising it when I was preparing for this talk, it's a bit male-dominated still, so we've got some work to be done there. But for instance, one of the recent ones, Professor John O'Keefe in 2014, um, he was awarded a, um, a Nobel Prize in medicine for that discovery of the cells which constitute the positioning, you know, the positioning system in the brain, so kind of our own internal GPS which helps us orientate ourselves. So he had the Nobel Prize for that, and then clearly um, a, a very well-known name, Francis Quick, Quick, Crick, <laughs> and um, his good friend James Watson and Maurice Wilkins all got a Nobel Prize um, in um, 1962 for their discovery of DNA. Um, Francis Crick was a graduate of this university and about the same time as he got the Nobel Prize was also a fellow of UCL. And the Crick Institute is another iconic building which you'll find around the Bloomsbury area. So as well as the fact that you'll be studying with all these names in the background and some world very much world-leading experts now, the university is really committed to the aims and principles of Athena Swan around the progression of women in universities. And it was one of the first universities to sign up to the scheme in, 20, in 2005 and got the silver award in 2015. And we're working hard, hopefully, to achieve a gold award. Um, but we're very committed to work on the promotion of equalities initiatives around race, gender, religion and belief, sexual orientation and disability. We're also quite ambitious. This university is quite ambitious, in case you haven't already noticed. But we're, So we are, as well as being academically ambitious, we're looking at how to make a difference, how to make new things, and we're also having a new campus over on the site of the Olympics in UCL East. And I would suggest that any of you who don't know about it, have a look at it on the website. And during your time here, it, it will actually be very near to fruition. So go to, get on the train, go out to Stratford and have a look and see what's going on there. So complementing all this work, we are firmly committed, and this is part of my work, to international, to working with 
other universities in other parts of the world to try and sort of address global challenges and co-create with other universities wise solutions to big problems. What we try to do in our partnerships are really partnerships of equivalence. So there's some really, really very important partnerships in my area in East Asia. But what we try to do is rather than having a UCL team and the partner university team what working on something or other. It's working on something that couldn't happen if the two teams work separately. So making something um, more significant by the fact that you're bringing academics from two different parts of the world together. Um, we have a global engagement office that supports that, and there are international study abroad experiences for undergraduates too. Employability, a couple more things, that's a bit of a boast, and then we'll go on to some more practical matters. But employability, UCL's in the world's top 20 for employability. Um, for you as intercultural travellers already, with education and background in at least two countries, and a degree from an outstanding university, assuming you all work hard, um, you will be in great demand. And finally, I wanted to just mention entrepreneurship as well. So as well as being pretty ambitiously academic, we also encourage entrepreneurship with, um, for, with students. So last year, um, I was amazed when I heard about it. So this UCL students, these were people who just finished their second year. They won the Holt Prize with a business idea aiming to alleviate food poverty in Southeast Asia. You'll find lots of details on the website. It's called Rice Inc. But they got, for this prize, so these are, you know, three... Was it three or was it five? Anyway, a team of young undergraduate entrepreneurs, they won a, a million dollar prize, um, which is quite a lot to seed fund, not literally with rice seeds, but to seed fund their business. And that's, that was pretty amazing. Went off to the United States to get their prize. We have also spin-off companies um, from a lot of our research. So one of, just one example is a, the company Autolus, which develops and commercializes um, T-cell uh, T therapies for the treatment of various cancers. So you're here. This is all about to begin. You've got a really busy week ahead of you. Um, it can seem, I think, starting uni quite daunting at times, of people talking to you about it, but there, is, there are people here to help. Now, clearly, the best help is to talk to the people next to you, do as much as you can to make lots of friends this first week. But there is a network of help and always support there for well-being and with disability and mental health advisors. So make use of that should you, if you need to. When you're in London, you already have seen some of the buildings. You'll already have seen the main building. But make use of everything there is to offer really here. It is a great city. You're right at the centre of it here. And I'm not suggesting you should skive lectures, clearly, but within walking distance, there is, um, there is Regent's Park. You can always go and sit there to work some afternoons. But there's some wonderful open spaces in London. Um, you can go to... There's some, obviously, clearly we're near the British Library, we're near the British Museum. Um, student... Uh, status gives you all kinds of access to cheaper theatre tickets and all, all kinds of things to distract you from studying, in fact. Um, <laughs> I could go on, but maybe I shouldn't. Um, but also intercultural things. That's just Chinese New Year down in Gerrard Street in Chinatown. But there's loads of... It is a global city. Go out and find out about it. Also in Bloomsbury, which I like looking at, if you look on a lot of the houses around here, you'll see blue plaques, little blue signs, which says which person, which very famous, and there's a lot of them, which very famous person lived here at various um, times in, in over the past um, centuries. And not far from here, you'll find a plaque that um, says where Chopin lived for a while. You'll find a plaque that says where Lenin lived for a while, as well as Charles Dickens and Virginia Woolf, etc. So you'll get this idea that actually... You know, London and Bloomsbury was a bit of a global hub, um, even, even in earlier times as well. Has been for quite some time. So finally, just to finish off, when I was thinking about this... Oh, actually, no, because I'm from the north of England, one thing I did want to say was, as well, in the vacations, for those of you who are staying in the UK sometimes, get out of London too. London's all right, but the north of England... I'm from, I'm from Yorkshire. Get out of London. You know, get out of London. Go and explore the rest of the country. It's all right, and um, there's lots of nice things to to do there too. 
But I was trying to think back to my own first year at university, which was quite a long time ago now, but we won't, go, we won't dwell on that, and, and sort of come up with a few things um, that worried me at the time and that with the benefit of age, I found <laughs> not to be such a worry. The first thing is, do not, do not, do not think that you're the only one with a particular problem, um, because I think you'll find... <laughs> always with most problems is that quite a few other people have the same problem as you. So the best way to do it is to talk to people and to talk to people about it. Don't bottle it up, is, is my suggestion. I'm not, I'm not as, you know, <laughs> a psychologist, but that's what I think, life, life experience. Certainly get out and talk to other people doing other subjects. One of the greatest things I thought in my first year at uni was, it was just really interesting. I mean, you might, I found it hard personally to be you know, to understand why people are a bit excited about physics. But there were people who were, and I enjoyed talking to them because actually it gave me an insight into, it's just talking to people that are enthusiastic about things. Um, and, you know, and it's actually, you can learn a lot from them, and I certainly did in my first year. So do that, explore, I've already covered that. Um, meet home students and find, try something new. Uh, again, I'm not saying you shouldn't work, but there are loads of student societies here. Get out and take yourself out of your comfort zone and try, try a new sport, try a new hobby. Um, enjoy it. Uh, and then finally, just a little health and safety one, which I think, because I walk from King's Cross down to this campus um, every day, because I come in, actually, bizarrely enough, live in Cambridge. Um, but anyway, I walk through and... At 9 o'clock in the mornings and 5 in the evenings in particular, there are a humongous number of cyclists in the cycle lanes and pedestrians on the pavements. And there are some near misses quite a lot of the time. So all I'm suggesting is that, what, certainly in those peak periods, don't try crossing the roads looking at your phone at the same time. I'm not suggesting you would, but people do. And um, it's just some, there's some very fast cyclists. And I cycle and I walk, so I can sort of identify with both. But just take care. So I'd want to finish off with leaving you the last word, well, actually leaving you with the last word of another UCL's, of a, another of UCL's Nobel Prize winners. You find out who said this, but it's a good quote for me to end on this lunchtime, um, as I wish you all the best for your time. The quote is, you can't cross the sea merely by standing and staring at the water. Now, you've already physically, literally crossed the sea to get here, However, think also of the sea as a metaphor for your time at UCL and see this quote as a call to get involved in all aspects of university life. Thank you very much for listening and really good luck. Have a great time. Okay, so you have heard um, a little bit from us now, and we would now like to hear from you. So this part, next part, is a little bit interactive and a little bit technological as well, so we really hope that it all comes together. Um, so what we want you to do is to get into small groups. You may have already met some of the people around you, um, and you have, we're going to give you a few minutes just to have a discussion with your new friends um, about what you are most worried about, about being a new student here at UCL, and then what you're most looking forward to. And at the same time, we would also need you, if you haven't already done so, to log on to the Wi-Fi, and you can also find instructions on the front of your sheet. We will explain why in a second, but we'll give you a couple of minutes to have a chat with your neighbours.
Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. So hopefully um, you've had a few minutes now to discuss those questions, and hopefully you're also on Wi-Fi. So what we're going to ask you to do now is to join us, as it says on the board, at slido.com. So if you just open a web browser and type in slido.com, which you can just see behind the head here, and then when you're on the page, you just need to type in hashtag 1247. And what we've set up is a quick poll. What we want to know from you is what you are most worried about about your time here at UCL. It looks like some people have already started to vote, which is really great. It's super quick. Um, we're going to have a look at the poll, and then we're going to give you some support services that can help you overcome those feelings, particularly in the first few weeks. So three votes so far. Oh, four. Oh, it's working really well. Okay, so two oh, clear, oh, one clear winner at the moment. It looks like uh, most people are worried about making friends and settling in. I hope, I mean, we hope that throughout the week you at least get to meet a few new people and through, throughout the sessions today. Okay, so almost, oh, there we go. So we've had 100 votes, so hopefully most people have had a chance. I mean, more, slightly more than 100 here, but we've got a fairly clear idea now of where the kind of main worries lie. So what we're going to give you now is um, a few examples of the types of support that you can access in the first few weeks of your time here at UCL and then all throughout your enrolment here um, and your time as a student um, to help you overcome some of these feelings. So we're back. Right, so um, like Claire said, we're all sort of in the same boat at the moment. So throughout the next slides, uh, we're just going to show you the avenues that you can take in um, um, getting support for any sort of issues that you, you may encounter throughout the year here at UCL. Um, first stop, we will talk a little bit about well-being services um, and just a few words about um, the different teams and areas that we cover. So all the teams are very happy to see you at any point during the next few weeks or throughout um, the academic year. And they always provide the safe and confidential advice. So we look after your personal privacy. So whatever you disclose to us, it will remain with us. Um, in terms of uh, the actual services, we have uh, mental health and well-being advisors. We have disability advisors. Um, they do daily drop-in uh, services. Um, so you can just walk in um, during certain times and uh, have a quick chat if you're feeling unwell or if you're feeling a little bit down um, during that day. Or they can also um, make longer appointments where you could uh, discuss, um, where you could have a bit, a bit more time to explain your um, situation. Um, th there's also support for students with learning difficulties. Um, we have um, a comms team that runs the student support and wellbeing blog, so I strongly recommend you sign up for that. Um, and there's also an area on their website um, about health, uh, uh, about sorry, self-help uh, resources. So you'll find all that you need in terms of uh, supporting your, yourself throughout the transition period. Cool. And. Um just to continue on with that then, we, uh, you may have already been actually, if you've been in London for a few days now, uh, we have a brand new student centre which is located on Gordon Street, so just about a five minute walk from here, um, and within the student centre is the student inquiry centre. This is very much your first point of contact whilst you're here with us at UCL. If you have any kind of question about 
your enrolment status or your fee status, um, if you need a letter, so if you're applying for council tax ex exemption or you're applying for a bank account, you can get a letter from the student centre. Um, Ask UCL is a relatively new inquiry system that we have here at UCL. You are kind of our first cohort of students who will be using it. Um, and part of it includes a really comprehensive FAQ section. So if you have a question about you know, how to get a transcript, how to study abroad, how to pay your fees, and you're not on campus or you're not, you can't easily visit the Student Inquiry Centre, you can have a look at Ask UCL and find an FAQ which will answer that for you. Um, who here is living in a, student, a UCL student accommodation this year? Also loads of people. So this is good. This is relevant to you. So within your hall of residence, um, you have a dedicated warden and a group of student residence advisors. And again, they're your first point of contact for any help with any issues that you might have with your accommodation. Um, they're also really good people to speak to about social events that are happening in your, in your halls, particularly in the first few weeks. Uh, we, UCL has a dedicated chaplain and interfaith advisor. We offer lots of specialist information and support. And we also work with external companies. So if you feel that you might benefit from someone uh, speaking to someone who's not related to UCL, it's completely com confidential from UCL, we have a care first service that you can access. This is a lot of information to take in, I appreciate. So if you can see just above the chairs here, we've got a couple of links and you can find lots of information about these services on those web pages. Right, so still on the topic of um, healthcare and the healthcare system in the UK, we've invited here today Dr. Claire Elliott, who is from the Richmond Practice, and is going to talk a little bit about taking care of yourself. I can shout. Oh, that's better. All right. So, hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Claire Elliott. I'm one of the doctors from Ridgemount Practice, which is the GP service that is very close to campus. We can work in tandem with UCL. So, you can't have been here very long without um, learning about the NHS. It's kind of barely a day goes by without it being in the news. So, I want to tell you how we can look after you and what you can do in terms of registering with the NHS. So this offers free healthcare, at, not according to uh, payment, so you will not have to pay for it, but you do have to do something to get it. You have to register with a GP, and they will be the first port of call for almost all illness. So there's some other places that actually can help as well. You can go to a pharmacy to get some minor advice. And once you're registered with the NHS, you can use the 111 service, which is our out-of-hours service, for some telephone advice. If there is an emergency, and that really means, you know, sadly, you are run over by a cyclist, as was mentioned in the first talk, or, unfortunately, something more serious, you can go to A&E. But for almost everything else, please come and see your GP. So let's talk a little bit about a GP and what they are. A GP is the person who takes overall care for you. They'll be able to man manage most of your illnesses, give you prescriptions if you need them. But you need to go and register. Now, for all of those of you who lived in halls of residence, we will cover your area. Uh, you can look up and see if you're registered, if you're eligible to register. If you live in North and Central London, we will cover that area. To register with us, you can start the service, the, the start by doing it by filling in the online forms on the address here at Campus Doctor, and that puts your details in, and then you come and see us, and we can complete the registration. We do like to see every one of you just to say hello and tell you what we can offer and do some initial health screening at that first consultation. What you need to bring is your UCL card and some confirmation of your address. So, 
what we've done is we're doing special late nights and weekend working to kind of make it as quick as possible for you. The times are up here. So this Saturday we're going to be available from 10 to 4 and we've got some late nights. So that once you've done the registration forms, you just come in and see us and then we'll kind of be able to make sure you're registered. Now the reason this is really important is you need to actively register so you can get your NHS number which allows any referral to go through, so it is important. Uh, the big blue arrow is where we are. We're on campus, we're just, or just a few minutes away. We're in Ridgemount Street, and I've got a picture of our front door for those of you who prefer kind of images to maps. So the rest of the time, we try and make it easy for students. We have walk-in service for urgent problems or for quick problems every morning and every afternoon during the week. If it's a more complex problem, please book an appointment and you'll be getting get more time and it allows us to kind of follow things up in, a, in more detail. Every contact you have with us is confidential. That means from your tutors, from your parents, from anyone else, and there's no exception to that. If, however, your health problem is having an impact on your study and you would like us to let your department know, we're certainly happy to help with that and we can do a letter that you will find you'll need for your department to make any allowances. But it's always much better if we've seen you about it beforehand. Uh, if you need to see a specialist, we can certainly refer you on. You can't get to see a specialist by going through a &E. That's not a shortcut. a &E is really for emergencies. So if you've got a long-standing medical problem, please come and see us. What are the other things we do? Well, we have nurses who are very experienced, who can offer healthcare advice, uh, any other things that uh, are on the list. If you need advice on contraception or sexual health, we can also help you with that, either a doctor or a nurse. And we have a travel clinic if you're going abroad. Two last things to mention are meningitis and MMR. I hope all of you will have had your meningitis immunizations before you came because the time you're most at risk is the first few couple of weeks. If you haven't had it, we can give it to you when you register. Um, Similarly with measles, mumps and rubella, the MMR vaccine, almost everybody should have had it. It's universally given. But if you have checked at home and you haven't had it, we can certainly give it to you. So our take home message is welcome. We're happy to look after you. The only active thing you need to do is register with a GP, fill in the online forms and come and see us. And we hope you have a good time while you're here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, so follow, following on from the previous presentation, just a few words on your healthcare eligibility in the UK. So first of all, um, for students who are here on a programme which is less than six months, you will not be able to register with a GP, with a general practitioner. However, of course, you can access the, um, you can access the services in case of emergency, but you may have to pay. Um, so, for the EU and EEA students, you may be asked for, European, for your European health insurance card in order to access the NHS services. And the non-EU or EEA students, you should have a private medical insurance in order to ensure that you're covered for the period of time that you're here with us, okay? Um, on to the students who are here for longer than six months. So if you are here for more than six months, you can obviously uh, register with the GP. Um, for non-European, so non, uh, so international students, you would have already paid the immigration healthcare surcharge um, for your visa. 
So that allows you to uh, access the NHS in the same way that uh, normal students do. So you just need to show that you're a UCL student. For European students, you may still need to um, present your European health insurance card, your EHIT card, in order to access the NHS and the medical services. Um, having said that, when the UK leaves the European Union with or without a deal, um, healthcare requirements may change. Um, students are very strongly encouraged to apply for the EU settlement scheme in order to protect their immigration status and access to healthcare after um, the UK leaves the European Union. More, so for any questions about um, what's going to happen next, um, you have the uh, website down here, so if you want to take a picture, please do so. Um, the slides will be put up on the International Student Support website as well, so you'll have access to that. So every communication um, in relation to Brexit, we wanted to avoid using the B word today, but <laughs> there you go. Um, any communication um, uh, that is relevant will be put up on that page, and also you will receive um, emails throughout um, the next... Um, few weeks, I would say, with what's going on and what you need to know. Okay? Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. It's a fairly confusing situation at the moment, obviously, given where we are within the European Union. But if you have any questions about your own status, do just come and have a chat with us at the end of the session today. Okay, so looking a little bit at um, support for you as new UCL students, you will be having uh, inductions with your department over the next few days or possibly into next week. Um, there is lots of UCL uh, academic support for you, particularly in these first few weeks as you join the university. Uh, you will be assigned a transition mentor, and that is a student who is able to help you really make that transition from high school, from secondary school, into university life. It can be quite an adjustment. Um, you'll also have a dedicated personal tutor, and we really do encourage you to engage with your personal tutor as much as you can. They are here to look out for you academically, but also to look out for your welfare. So it's really good to get to know them as early as you can and make sure that you attend regular meetings with them. Within your department, you will have a team of administrators who can help you with some of the more practical elements of your degree programme, so things like course enrolment, module selection, um, any questions that you might have around exams. So again, make sure that you familiarise yourself with them when you meet your, your department shortly. And we also have lots of online uh, e-learning resources. So you may have already heard of Portico and Moodle. Uh, they are both online platforms uh, for, for learning, and they are often uh, the platforms that you'll submit your work through, uh, receive results through as well. In terms of settling in and social life, we will actually be covering a lot of information on this later on today. Um, but just to touch on a couple of things, you will be hearing from the UCL Students' Union later on, and they will be telling you about um, the clubs and societies that they encourage you to get involved in, as well as the really busy calendar of social events that they'll be running over the next couple of weeks. Um, give it a go events, again I think the, the union will chat about them later on, but they're re a really good way to kind of sample some of what the societies offer without having to commit to joining them. So if you know that you might want to join kind of five or six, but you're not quite sure if you've got the time to commit to that many societies, you can go to one of the give it a go events which will be happening in the next few weeks. They're one-off events, and you often just pay a very small price for them, or they may be free, and they just give you a taste of what that society is like, so you can then decide if it's something you want to pursue further. UCL has a really established volunteering service, um, and if you are able to, so if you're here on a visa, obviously check within the terms of your visa, but you may well be able to volunteer, uh, both in UCL projects and local projects in the community. So it's a really nice way to get out of the kind of UCL bubble a little bit once you're settled here um, and help in the local community. And Host UK, we should also mention this, this is a fantastic organisation um, that we work with that allows you, as international students, to spend a small period of time, so possibly a weekend or sometime over the Christmas or Easter holidays, with a British family. So you'll go and live with them, you'll eat with them, you'll kind of go out on days out with them, and it's a really nice way to kind of get familiar with British culture if you're not too familiar already. Uh, more support, again... Feel free to kind of take some time to have a look through these services and feel free to take a picture as well. Um, there are lots of 
uh, resources at UCL to help you with your academic English. So if, for example, English isn't your first language and you feel that you might just need a bit of extra support to make sure that your, your writing is of a really good academic standard, you can access any one of these um, services. Some are run by the Student Union and some are run specific, uh, are specific departments at UCL. Um, services such as the Writing Lab, you can often drop in. They will have sessions that you can go to if you have an upcoming um, essay or an assignment that you want to run past them and they can just double check with you that, that what you're writing kind of makes sense. Um, money, we again will be getting lots of top tips from our ambassadors later on, but there are also external organisations that can help you manage your money. London can be a fairly expensive city. Um, it's really the amount of money that you spend depends on really on what, how far your budget will allow. Um, there are lots of support services here at UCL, so we have a dedicated student funding team. If you are a little bit concerned about how you're going to make your money stretch across the course of a term or a week, although hopefully not a week, uh, or the time that you're here at UCL, you can uh, book an appointment with our welfare advisor to chat through, to chat them through that. Um, the Students' Union also have an advice centre and they are very, um, they would encourage you to go and have a chat with them about issues around money, but also other legal issues. So if you have a question about your landlord, if you're living independently or part-time work, you can pop along and speak to them as well. All right, so just um, a brief overview of the um, various opportunities that you're going to have here as a UCL student. Um, and obviously, we have put ourselves first, uh, because we're from the study abroad team, of course, <laughs> we're talking about UCL Go Abroad and our programs. We know that you've just arrived to London, uh, but we want to send you away somewhere else. <laughs> um, so basically, what we provide is opportunities for students to go abroad from um, one week to a full academic year on a variety of different programs. Um, we also have the UCL Innovation and Enterprise Department, which um, basically helps students become entrepreneurs. Uh, we have UCL Minds, which is um, an online calendar of all the relevant events that happen at UCL. One example is um, the Lunch Hour Lectures, uh, which is also up there on the slide. Um, the Global Citizenship Program, which is something that you can join and through that program, you'll get to participate in uh, a variety of um, programs um, with a social sort of focus, um, and that would make you become a global citizen here in London. Um, we have UCL Change Makers, so that's a set of um, uh, research projects that you may be interested in getting involved in. Um, and also, within departments, you will also have um, a variety of other opportunities and activities that you take, you can take part in in order to uh, gain a few more things to put on your CV and boost your employability skills. Okay, great. So, um, we appreciate that you've only just joined UCL, so your career may not be the first thing that you're thinking about whilst you're sitting here today, but we really think there's no, um, no better time to start thinking about what the future will hold for you. So I'd like to invite Colin Farron from UCL Careers to the stage. Thank you, thank you. Hello. 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 Is this on? Can you hear me? Welcome, everybody. It is working, yes. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Colin. I'm a careers consultant with UCL Careers. UCL Careers is here to support you um, to really figure out what it is that you want to do after university. I know, strange, you're only just arrived, we're already planning and thinking about after. No, my message is just to let you know that we are here and we exist. So you can choose to come to us when you feel it's right. Um, so today, in the next just five minutes, I want to run through a couple of the services and resources that we offer you. So again, you have an idea about what we do. Um, just before that, just to say that employers look for a broad range of skills, as you would imagine, particularly in the UK, and also attributes, so skills like negotiating, communicating, attributes like resilience, confidence, leadership. So employers in the UK are looking for a broad range of skills and not solely just what degree did you do. So it's important to recognize that you are gaining a broad spectrum of these kind of skills through your degree, yes, absolutely, but also through the activities that you take part while you're here in UCL. So do have a lot of fun, do get involved in societies, maybe volunteer somewhere, and you'll be building up a great wealth of experience that any employer will really like to see. So, 
what do we do? What can we offer you? So these are the three main pillars, I suppose, of what we offer. We do meet you one-to-one, -one, if you would like, and we can talk about your career, give you some guidance. Perhaps you're uncertain about what that looks like and you want to make sense of it. Maybe you have a clear idea about what your next step will be in several years' time, um, but you're struggling to make sense of how to get there. So we can assist with that. We also, as you would imagine, uh, we can review your CVs, application forms, stuff like that. So if you're sending stuff off, whether it's for a part-time role or a full-time role, feel free to come on in and we'll review that with you. If you have a, an interview lined up, you can do a practice interview, a mock interview. We'll put you through your paces, we'll be the interviewer, and we'll give you some feedback on your performance so you can perform better in the real thing. Fairs and events, or events and workshops. Um, we've had about 900 employers, I'd say, last year. It seems to be about around that every year. Engage with us and engage with you directly. And they do that through fairs, they do it through uh, workshops and presentations. So just to say, a fair might be uh, focused on a particular sector, like IT and technology, banking and finance, something like that. We have many of them. And lots of employers come in and they're there to talk about the graduate opportunities, what's in store, what's available. And you can actually ask them very direct questions. Um, if you're not interested in that more corporate focus, the larger organizations, the commercial entities, we do run several themed weeks. Uh, this is where we have lots of different events over a week focused on a particular sector, such as the environment, uh, media, uh, international development. And we bring in a lot of alumni, actually, to talk about their own experience of what it's like to work there and indeed how they got there. So really valuable weeks. Um, as I suggested, there's a lot of presentations, workshops, skill development that we offer as well. We do, of course, have a vacancies board. So if you went online to our website, um, you can go through and have a look at what jobs are available at the moment, both locally in the UK, but also abroad. We have quite a few uh, international jobs too. Um, and there's a few different schemes that will come available over the year to really push those uh, global opportunities and even short-term internships as well. So you can keep an eye on what's available all year round on the jobs board. Um, one thing I would recommend for you to check out is our series of lunchtime talks. Again, this may not be for this week, it'll probably be for uh, later in the year. But we have these series of lunchtime talks called Career Essentials. Nice phrase. So the essential talks that you should really look at. Um, these might be about figuring out what you're going to do next, but it might be about something focused on finding a job, creating the best CV, interviewing effectively, creating a great LinkedIn profile, seeking a master's, whatever it might be, we've got a series of lunchtime talks. Also, under the same title, we do have uh, a couple of those are uh, e-learning modules that you can do. So when you're logged into Moodle, you should be able to access that. But do check it out via our main webpage, Career Essentials. So just to note, a few things for you guys. Uh, again, not so much for now, but for later potentially. Time does fly. Uh, if you are interested in the larger, more corporate entities, they have very structured programs, structured intake of graduates. So often called the Graduate Scheme or Internship or Insight Week. Um, and they, in the UK, start recruiting often a year in advance almost. They are recruiting now for next year, if you can imagine that. Now there is a peak around November, um, and there are still things available right through to January or so. But if you are interested in one of the larger corporate entities, do make sure that you're prepared in the right way, that you're perhaps aware of what's coming up several months ahead. Um, but of course, it's not all about waiting for that job. You're building up lots of skills through your societies that you're involved in or hobbies that you're involved into. For those out, who are from outside of the EU, uh, your right to work in the UK is restricted. Um, you should be aware of that, and the International Student Support Service, International Student Support in UCL, they should be able to detail all the, the legal aspects of your visa that you're currently on. Suffice to say that you cannot work more than 20 hours a week, and that's very important for you not to break if you don't want to uh, get into some trouble. I have a question or just a hand. No, just a hand. Um, 
If you're interested in working, um, uh, getting a visa for, and staying perhaps in the country, do check out the UK CISA webpage, UK Council of International Student Affairs. Lots of bite-sized, relatively easy to understand information there. Um, if you are intending to work um, at all, actually, yes, even if you are an EU citizen, for everybody here, you will need a national insurance number. Um, so if you just Googled UK national insurance, you'll find it immediately, I'm sure. But do get that number if you intend to work whatsoever, because I think it's, it's essentially if you're working over a very small amount of hours that you need to get one of these. Um, so what next? My takeaway message would be have a look at what we have to offer in UCL Careers. Keep an eye on the events. So that's the web page there. But if you just type in UCL Careers, you'll eventually find it too. It will take you to a, a, your own portal called My UCL Careers, where you can see a calendar of all the events that are on and all the times of any one-to-one -one appointments, etc. So that's really it for me. I'll just say, uh, oh, this is where we are. That's important as well. So you can come in and have a look uh, and speak to anybody at any time, uh, just for basic information. Uh, we're on the fourth floor of this building here, which is opposite Waterstones. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so now have you, you've heard a little bit about opportunities at UCL. You've heard about careers. Next, uh, we have UCL security. So Sophie and Oli will talk to us about uh, crime prevention and personal safety whilst you're a student. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, Thank you. I am Oliver, by the way, not Sophie, but just <laughs> to cause confusion. Um, Sophie's going to deliver the speech, but what I just wanted to start off by saying um, I have been the Deputy Screen Manager at UCL for 12 years, which to me isn't a long time, but to you is probably half your life. Um, and I have seen and spoken to a lot of people, and what there are so many messages, so many things we want to say, but we've only got a short amount of time. So what we're going to sort of highlight is some of the crimes or some of the things that could happen to you if you don't look after yourselves. But I say, after this, if you want to speak to us, our emails uh, details will be at the end, but we've also got um, a stall uh, tomorrow when you pick up your ID cards. Myself, Sophie, or a colleague will be there. So if you've got any questions, please come and see us or write to us, because again, I'd rather speak to you about how to look after yourself than speak to you afterwards if something has happened. But I'll hand you over to Sophie now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> that was for me. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah, great. Um, so yes, welcome to UCL. You've made an excellent choice, as I'm sure you're already aware. Um, we are here today um, to give a short presentation um, to basically go through some of the um, potential crimes that happen um, on campus um, and also outside of the campus. Um, but essentially, as UCL security, our key objective um, is to provide a safe and secure working environment for all UCL staff, visitors, and students. Okay, so we're just going to go through some of the key um, sort of bulk crime. So one of our top crimes reported is theft. Um, for example, we'll get reports of phones being stolen, laptops, bikes, and cash. Um, essentially, you know, without any of these items, um, you can be a little bit lost. So without your phone, how do you make calls? How do you make friends? How do you go out and have fun? Um, without your laptops. How do you work? How do you study without your laptop? That's key. Um, without your bike, how do you get around? And without cash, yeah, how do you have a good time? Um, so, you know, we want you to keep hold of your belongings, and it's really important that, you know, if you listen to our advice, we really hope you're going to keep hold of everything that you've, you've come here with. Okay, so phone snatching. Um, we've had a number of reports of, of phone snatching um, out um, just beyond the sort of the campus boundaries. Um, so some of the surrounding roads, there have been reports of, of phone snatching. Um, essentially, mopeds can sometimes, as, as demonstrated here, actually mount the curb in order to access someone's phone. Um, the common theme with all of these photos is that the victim is completely unaware. 
So they're unaware of their surroundings, they're unaware that someone is right next to them about to steal their property. So we would say when you're out and about, just have a look around you. If you're lost and having a look on your phone, that's fine, we understand. But you know, if you can, just look around, look up every now and again and just be aware of where you are um, and who is around you. The other tip we would give is to try and keep your phone on the side um, away from the curb. So should someone mount the curb on a bike or um, a bicycle or a moped, um, it's more difficult for them to come around you into, the, into sort of further pedestrian traffic. So we'd say keep your phone away from the road. Um, and then if you can, also keep your lock on your phone. Then it will just make it more difficult for anyone that's trying to steal it to get into it and access your personal information. Um, we've got just details at the bottom here of um, a mobilise, which is um, a system that you can register your phone on so that you can report it as lost. Okay. Um, another very common theft will be a distraction theft. So in these three images here, um, you can see that someone has got their phone out in the desk in front of them. Um, someone has come along in this second photo and they've put a piece of paper down. It might be that they're asking for directions, they're asking for help, um, but this person here um, has covered the phone and this has allowed them, when they've then taken the piece of paper up, to take the phone with them. It could be minutes before that person has realised their phone has gone and at that point it's too late. You know, they've got your phone and it's going to be very hard um, without the correct images to get that back. Okay, and very briefly, phone protection. Every, all of your iPhones, all of your Android phones should have security settings. If they're switched on, that's fantastic. It then prevents um, thieves from sort of resetting your phone and accessing your personal information. We'd always say, best case is just to put a lock, um, so either a, a thumbprint or a code on your phone, um, just to prevent from people from being able to access your, your personal information. Okay, another very common theft um, is of laptops and bags. So in a lot of our um, UCL cafes, libraries, anyone can access these areas. So, you know, it's not just yourselves, students that are accessing these areas. It could be criminals coming off the street. Um, so we would say, you know, very basic advice. Please keep your bags and valuables with you in sight at all times. I think it's quite tempting to go in, you know, go into a busy cafe, there's not many seats, you want to put your bag down and then save the seat with the bag and go over and get your coffee or, or whatever you might be getting. The problem with that is you turn your back, all it takes is one person to walk along, take your bag and walk off and it's gone. That could be a really valuable, um, you know, your, your bag could contain valuables which will be very difficult to get back. So yeah, please do, just keep your items with you. Um, or at least keep sight of everything that, you, um, that you've got there with you. Okay. And then, so, um, prevention of bike thefts. All we'd say on this, it's two very simple messages. If you can, if you're going to leave your bike unattended um, on campus, please um, try and use two locks. So we always advise a D-lock and a cable lock. The reason for this is it's a deterrent. Should a criminal come along and try and steal your bike, if they have to get through two locks, it's going to take them a long time. They might get noticed. They're less likely to try a bike with two locks than with one. Um, and the other piece of advice would be that if you can, always use official bike racks. On your UCL app that hopefully you've all downloaded, it will show you where you can access um, those bike racks. All of these locations have CCTV. So should anyone approach your bike, we'll be able to see that on the CCTV. Um, and we'd be able to download that as evidence. So it's worthwhile parking your bikes there. Um, this is particularly topical because already, unfortunately, this week there has been a very expensive bike theft because it wasn't stored um, in one of our um, UCL bike racks. So it's just worth sort of taking, taking this point in um, and thinking, you know, this is an expensive item, just make sure you look after it. Okay. Pickpockets and thieves. Um, as we were saying earlier, at peak time, so sort of nine in the morning and again at sort of five, you'll find that the roads surrounding the university are very busy. So in all of these pictures, you're sort of looking at people who are, you know, in crowds. Um, all the victims are unaware of their surroundings. So again, you know, there's items like bags open here. There's, you know, people here who have not 
not got their bags close enough. Really, really simple to prevent. All you need to do is make sure that your bags are always locked, uh, so zipped up um, and close to you, and that you're keeping an eye on your possessions. Because um, it can be really easy just to swipe something away, and then it's gone. Um, something that has been um, a bit more, um, well, a certain crime that we've been looking out for lately has been a spate of um, thefts by card reader. So the card readers that you use in shops and bars um, that you just tap, um, basically there'll be people, that, thieves, that will come up, come very close to your bag um, and try and withdraw cash, so make a cash transaction from your card. So we have um, purchased a huge quantity of card defenders, um, which we are giving out for free. So if you put your card in that, it can't, no one can come up and try and um, do a transaction on your card and, and take away your money. So it's well worth um, coming and collecting one of, this, one of these because these will be um, yeah, given out uh, either today in the Roberts building or for the next week. So please do come and, and speak to us and come and collect one. Okay, so bogus police officers or fake police officers do operate in the area. Um, they can be in some sort of form of uniform, but mostly they are not. Um, essentially, what they're trying to do is get your personal information and try and get belongings from you. Um, a number of times they've asked for PIN numbers and cash. Um, no officer would ever ask that. So if anyone approaches you and asks for that information, please do feel free to question their authority to come to security and ask whether that's legitimate or call 101, which is the non-emergency police number. Um, if you give a shoulder number, so the number of the police officer and the surname, they'll be able to check whether that's a real police officer or not. Okay, so it's just worth keeping, out, uh, keeping an eye on, on officers or individuals that are approaching you, pretending to be someone that they're not. Okay, and also just, yeah, so the final thing, you know, keeping an eye on money. So when you go out, we would advise always that you just take the amount of money that you're going to need for the day. Um, we would certainly never advise you to take out all the money that you have on you. Um, should you um, be a victim of any sort of theft or robbery, that's all your money gone, and it's very, it can be very difficult to retrieve money um, in particular. Um, we'd also advise not to leave really large quantities of money in your room. Um, we don't often have um, burglaries in halls of residence, but it can happen. So the most safe way to store your money will be in a bank account. So, so if you take your, um, your identification and open a bank account here, that's your best way to keep your money safe. Um, and then just a final point. Um, just be cautious when using cash um, at, at certain shops or pay things in the street. Um, make sure you understand what the value of, of money is and you're not being overcharged. Um, but yeah, you can feel free to speak to, um, to UCL staff um, on advice when it comes to money. Okay, so frauds and scams. So I've kind of touched on this already. Um, I'm just going to sort of go through this quite very quickly. Um, just be really, really careful with any email attachments. Um, basically, people trying to get your personal data. If it looks suspicious, it probably is. Um, so just be really careful about clicking on any, um, any unusual looking um, emails or anything like that, just to keep your personal details safe. Um, we have had a couple of scams that have been quite significant um, in London, so in London universities particularly, in which uh, students have had calls from um, people pretending to be home office or visa, um, asking um, for money to be transferred into a different account. Please do not be rushed into transferring money into any other account until you've made sure that it's legitimate. So, you know, when you first get that call, if you get a call of that nature, please feel free to get the details of that person, put the phone down, check that it's real, and then get back to them. Never, ever give any money to anyone um, without really checking that actually the person you're sending it to is legitimate. Um, because, yeah, there have been huge quantities of money, up to £70,000, um, that have been uh, transferred uh, through fraud. Okay. Um, so, ATM security, this is just really sort of more general tips now. Um, please just be aware. Um, so, in this picture here, we've got a gentleman who's just withdrawing cash. He's put his card in. The gentleman on this side has said, 
um, is trying to get his attention and trying to distract him, whilst the gentleman on his right there um, would then swoop in when the money comes out. So essentially, all we'd say is wait until your card has been returned to you and your money has come out before you allow yourself to look away or become distracted by anything that's going on around you. Um, it just protects you and it protects your belongings. Um, and then more generally, obviously, protect your PIN um, and only use ATM machines um, at sort of well, um, in well-lit areas when, it's, when there's other people around. Um, most of this um, advice here is really straightforward, um, so just ever so quickly. Um, please make sure when you're going outside the campus, you know, go and explore London, it's a fantastic city, but make sure you plan your journey. So have a look into sort of train times, bus times before you go. Um, we'd always say with tubes, avoid empty tubes late at night. Um, stay where there's other people. Similarly on the bus, if you stay near the drive on the lower deck, it just means that there's, you know, there's actually CCTV in most buses now. It'll keep you safe. And please only get into licensed taxis. So that's the black cabs that have got license numbers. Or if you go via an app such as Uber, make sure you book it um, because these are the safest methods to get around. And of course, as mentioned earlier, cycling. If you're going to cycle, please be aware of the rules of the road. Um, wear suitable protective clothing. Um, and yeah, just make sure you're observing sort of cycle lanes and things like that. Um, and similarly with walking, walking is a fantastic way to get around London. Um, try to walk with friends, avoid sort of low-lit roads, um, and just be aware that if, you're, if you've got headphones on, um, there's, you know, there's a chance that, actually, that you might be easily distracted or not be aware of what's going on around you. It could be either. So um, please, yeah, just... Just have a quick look through these, um, these little bits, tips of advice um, when you get a chance. Okay, right, tailgating. You'll notice that there's a quite a few places on campus where you need to, um, you can only get access via your identification card. Um, all we'd say is just make sure that when you're going through a door, if there's someone tailgating you who doesn't have um, a lanyard or doesn't have any identification on, just either step to one side and let them go ahead of you um, or politely ask them um, to provide identification rather than just following you through because they may not be a student, they may not be a visitor, staff, um, they may have a different intention um, which is not, not something we want to encourage. Um, so yeah, please do um, either ask who they are or come to security and security will ask. Okay, really, really general tips um, in your accommodation, in your halls of residence. Um, please keep your valuables um, out of sight um, or ensure that you sort of close and lock your windows. It's just making uh, valuables easy to get. If, if windows are open, if they're on site, um, criminals will target um, sort of rooms or, or areas where they can get away with things easily. Um, if it's out and in sight, that's easy for them. Okay, did you know that Harry Potter is one of ours? No, <laughs> no, he's not really, it's a joke. Um, yeah, so um, hopefully in the next day or two you'll be picking up your identification cards. Um, please do carry them with you. Um, obviously you need to ha have them to be able to access certain areas of the, of the university. Um, but yeah, we'd just say please don't lend them to anyone else um, because if they get lent to someone else, um, they can get lost. Um, and then, yeah, we have some security issues around that, so please do keep hold of them. Okay, lovely. And then this is our details. So we've got here the 222 numbers. Um, if you'd like to take a photo of it and just make sure you've got it, um, it is a 24-hour line, so you can get hold of us on these numbers 24 hours a day. Uh, we've also got the emergency number here, which is 999. That'll get you through um, to the police um, if an emergency is taking place right now. Um, or if a crime has taken place and you'd like to report it, um, but it's already happened and there's no danger involved, please call 101 and then you can report it that way. Okay. Okay, and that's our details as well. Um, so um, please do feel free um, to contact us, email us anytime, and please do follow us on Twitter and Instagram for any events that we've got coming up. Um, but yeah, congratulations on being here. 
Um, and please do stop by Robert's building in the next week or two. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sophie and Oliver. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to change the pace again slightly now. And everything that's on the back of the sheets that you got when you came in will now become clear. Because, and we're, pay, we're playing for prizes here, so this is, it should be taken very seriously. Um, very nice the, prizes as well. Very nice prizes. We've got a UCL quiz. So what we need you to do is to get into groups of up to 10. And the bigger the group, nearer to 10, the better. So no more than 10, but if you can find a group near you, if you're super confident, you can be a group of one. OK, and what we're going to do is put a series of questions on the screen, and you've got three minutes only to answer as many as you can. We're then going to see, uh, look at the answers and find out a winner. OK, so if you've got your groups, we're now going to show you the question. Okay guys, you have one minute remaining, one minute left. to answer as many as possible We've got about four seconds left and then we're going to take the questions off the screen shall we do a countdown okay so hopefully you've managed to answer as many as possible ideally all ten what we're going to do now and we need total honesty in this we have to play fair in this one prizes to be won um, we're going to show you the answers. You'll have a minute or so just to work out how many you got right, and then we're going to name and shame and also find a winner. So, in red on the screen, here are the answers. Remember, we, 
We expect you to be honest, yeah? Some people who might have had, might have gotten 10. Might have had a 10. Oh, excellent. Okay, so hopefully now you've worked out how many you got right. What we'd like to do now is find out how everyone did. So to be honest, if you got less than five, there's no shame, but we won't embarrass you. So we'll start with five. <laughs> we'll start with five or more. So five or more, put your hands up. Okay, that's fairly good. If you've got six or more, keep your hand up. Okay, we've lost a few. Seven or more. Okay, not too many. Uh, what did I get to then? Eight? Eight, eight or eight. more? Nine or more? Okay, and any tens? Oh, oh we've got, got loads of tens. Okay. So what we've got we this group here. This group here. Just stand. Any, anyone with the ten stand up? I think we've got four groups. It's just hard to see everyone. Ten. Okay. Well done. However, unfortunately, what we've found ourselves in is a tie-break situation. So there's now one killer question because we can only have one winning team. So let me just remember what the question is in my head. Yeah. Um, so what we need is the first. As soon as you've got an answer, hand up. And it needs to be really, really high hand up because we can't really see everyone out here. And the, the team with the closest answer will win the prize. So, the tiebreak question is a study abroad one, uh, our domain. Um, in the academic year 2018-19, so last year, how many countries did we send UCL students to? <laughs> if you've got an answer, put your hand up groups of 10 and the closest team will win the prize. Yeah? 120 we've got here. Any other offers on 120? Oh. Only this winning, is valid only for, only for the winning team who got 10. 10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 110. Seven. 70. Okay. 40. 40. And is that all of our groups of 10? 60, okay. We've got the girls down here. And you guys, sorry? 55. 55. Okay, some very... Yeah? 97. 97. Oh, we've got really good answers. Okay. <laughs> we, could go, we could probably go on forever. Um, so last year, 2018-19, UCL sent... Uh, we sent UCL students to 72 different countries. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a winning team down here. Just a round of applause for our winning team. Well done, guys. That's it, you've passed, you've passed the UCL initiation, you are in. Um, and you can come and collect your prize in the break shortly. Um, okay. Oh, that takes us nicely to the break. Right, so um, unfortunately we've run a bit over, so we, would, um, we will have a five, ten, ten minutes break. If you do need to use the toilet, you can. They're just outside, down to your right. But please be back by ten past four, please. Thanks, guys.
thanks everyone. Welcome back. Um, thank you for coming back really promptly for, for us to begin our second session. Um, we have lots of information to get through in the next hour or so. Um, and we, uh, this session will, be, uh, in, will include a, a Q&A panel with our Global Ambassadors. So it's a chance for you to ask some questions um, and get answers on UCL Life and London Life from real life students. Um, and there will also be uh, the chance for us to give you a little bit more practical information about living in London. So, to start things off, we'd like to introduce Carmen up to the stage. Carmen was an affiliate student, just um, like a new international student as an affiliate, like you guys are here today, international students, and is uh, almost finished with her PhD, but she will tell you more about that. Um, so please welcome Carmen to the stage. I think I put this properly, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for coming back from the break to be here and listen to me. Uh, my name is Carmen. I'm a PhD student here at UCL. I'm on my fourth, um, hopefully last, year. Uh, and honestly, I started at UCL as an undergraduate student, just like you are doing now. Uh, and I'm here basically to, to share my experience, uh, my experience with you uh, today. I'm an archaeologist, uh, because that's actually a thing. Um, <laughs> I'm from Spain, and uh, about eight, eight years ago, in uh, 2011, I had the chance to spend uh, a year abroad and, and finish my undergraduate de degree in history here at UCL. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to get an Erasmus grant, and also uh, mad enough to choose uh, the UK rather than any other country such as Italy or, or Greece or, you know, countries with nice, actually nice weather. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but actually, uh, as it turns out, uh, it was a great decision. Um, so, eight years ago, here it was, uh, first time uh, living abroad, uh, away from my hometown, uh, and also uh, far from my family and my friends, um, completely out of the comfort zone, and, and well, what an opportunity it is actually to be, to be in London. I remember I spent, uh, I think my last, uh, my first two weeks in London, basically going to all the free entry museums and, and, and trying many different types of food. And, and I even managed to, to go to a musical for 10 pounds, which you may not know it yet, but it's quite an achievement in London, okay? Um, I, I probably spent more than I should have uh, uh, eating outside, uh, but, I don't know if it happens to you, but for me, when I first moved away from my parents' house, I had no idea of cooking. Um, but, uh, but it will get better. I, I'm better now, actually. Um, and apart from uh, walking around London and, and eating Chinese food, I, I also found out about um, student societies. Um, uh, we don't have this in Spain, okay? And they are a great way of actually uh, meeting new people and also trying uh, different activities. Um, and believe me, what I say, that is, whatever it is that you like, um, there is a society for it, and there is a bunch of people that uh, also share your interests. So in my case, I, I joined um, the uh, Chocolate Society, um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, and I also joined the Japanese Society, which uh, was full of non-Japanese people like me. <laughs> and, and also the, the, the UCL Kendo Club, uh, which uh, in there, basically, I, I, I managed to get a little bit fit. Uh, but I also uh, m met my, my first friends here in, in the UK. And well, apart from uh, being, being a, walking around, visiting museums, uh, joining societies, eating outside, I, I also studied. I, I study a lot. Um, <laughs> what? What is that? You don't like Chinese food? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was saying, uh, apart from, uh, I, was, I study a lot, okay? I, was, uh, I had classes in the history department, and also I managed to uh, take some models at the UCL Institute of Archaeology, which is, uh, I'm not exaggerating, and it's not because I'm doing my PhD in there, but it's one of the best um, uh, places to, to study if you're an archaeologist like me. Um, I, at UCL, both at in the history department and in archaeology, I found amazing lectures. Uh, that will make you uh, love their disciplines and, and they will uh, help you to, to get the most of it. 
Um, I also found out that there were many volunteering opportunities, and, and it is likely that you end up meeting uh, people that are important in, in your field uh, simply by attending to conference or, or, or volunteering or, or networking. Because that's actually what, what happened to me. Because uh, at the beginning of uh, 2012, I, I started volunteering in a, in a lab at the Institute of Archaeology. And, and in there, I, I got to learn uh, about different topics and, and research methods that they use. And, and thanks to be studying at UCL and thanks to be moving around and, and, and meeting people, networking and volunteering, uh, one of the professors at the department um, offered me to join his uh, fieldwork excavation uh, in the summer, uh, which was in Tanzania. So I, I suddenly passed from being the, this person that had never uh, studied abroad to spend three, three wonderful months in, in Tanzania in a lovely place called uh, Olduvai Gorge, which is uh, near the Serengeti National Park. And I managed to work alongside with experts in Paleolithic, uh, Paleolithic archaeology, uh, and also together with local people. And I even managed to uh, see uh, wild animals, which was like breath breathtaking, basically. And, and I think it's fair to say that for me, uh, at that time in there was uh, one of those so-called life-changing experiences. Um, uh, that you often uh, get when, when you go ab abroad, when you travel, and, and you meet people from different uh, cultural backgrounds and, and places, which is basically what you're doing right now. Um, so after that, after nine months in, in the UK and three months in Tanzania, I, I graduate. I, I passed my exams and I became a graduate in, in history. And honestly, um, I, I wasn't really ready to, to go back to Spain. Um, so I, I didn't know what to do with my life. I had no idea what to do next, but I, I knew that I wasn't really ready to leave London. So um, funny thing is that when they asked me to, to come here today and to talk to you, they told me, oh, why don't you tell them why you came back after being an affiliate when you came back to a PhD? But the truth is uh, that I never really left. Okay, I, I, I fell in love with, with the city, with the multicultural uh, atmosphere and the opportunities that you have in here. And, and since I wasn't sure what to do, I thought, well, I'm going to stay and, and see what happens. And this is probably something that my parents were not very happy about it, but that's, that's how it goes. So, uh, so after, after graduating, I, I, I was working in a coffee shop um, here in London, and this may look like I don't know, maybe a step back or something like that, but it wasn't really that. I, I, I like to think I improved my English while in there, um, but you can tell me about that. Um, and I also, I was working part-time, so <coughs> I was um, <coughs> able to, um, to keep on volunteering and, 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 and trying different things, volunteering in different places. And well, I ended I end up uh, working in there for about uh, four months. Uh, till I, I, a new opportunity was, was presented. Um, because um, at about, um, I think it was March, March 2013, uh, there was a job opportunity at my old uh, department, the Institute of Archaeology, uh, and they were looking for a lab technician. And, and I decided to apply, and, and they picked me. So I, I, I came back to UCL, uh, but this time as a member of staff. So, for me, this was the opportunity to work at my, at my dream place in an academic environment, uh, together working together with a student, which is what I love to do. And, and moreover, this, uh, this job also um, allowed me to uh, be part of the research team. Uh, so I managed to, to go back to Africa in fieldwork and to join the team in, in Tanzania and in Ethiopia. And, and also, while working at the, at, at the institute, I also got to know uh, experts from many different disciplines, such as uh, geology and, and anthropology and, and archaeological conservation, that with time, they, they are also really good friends now. Um, and while I was uh, working at UCL, because I was still, still part-time, uh, I, I, I decided to, to study a master on, on a part-time basis. So I, I took a, a master's program in, uh, in archaeology at Bitberg College, which is not very far away from here. I think it's less than five minutes walking. And, and 
it was nice because being part time also gave me the flexibility to to be able to to go once or twice on fieldwork to Africa and eventually end up graduating in uh, September 2015. So um, the good thing about studying here at UCL and, and also working in an academic environment is that I, I realized that that's actually what I wanted to do. Um, so it was at this point more or less that I, I thought I was about uh, ready to, to try and, and pursue a PhD. So um, being, being here, I, I got to know about the, the quality and the impact of the research. So my first option was to apply for PhD programs that allow me to conduct my project here at UCL. And, and I will, I guess you know the result because otherwise I won't be here talking. So uh, I got it, yes. Um, I was very, very lucky because I managed to get a, a London NERC uh, DTP scholarship and I was able to start my PhD program in 2016 together with uh, a group of people from many different disciplines. And, and right now I'm, I'm working with colleagues from UCL, but also the Natural History Museum. And, and I basically carry on doing what I love the most, which is um, going on fieldwork and study very, very old archeological remains and, and knowing about them and, and sharing this knowledge with, with my peers and, and with the students. And, and also, well, thanks to, the, thanks to be doing the PhD here, also um, I managed to be a teaching assistant, so I'm, I, I'm a kind of try to improve my teaching skills. I'm hopefully still going on with the public speaking, which is an ongoing process. Um, um, honestly, when, when looking um, to this very, very quick summary of the last eight years of my PhD, it may, it may seem like it was all very neat and, and straightforward, um, but it wasn't always like that. Um, I think it's fair to say that like every, probably every, every student at some point, or every one of us, I struggle sometimes. Um, I struggle with, with coursework, I struggle with the exam periods, uh, with stress, and, and well, sometimes it was just hard to be far away from the family and far away from friends. And, and I think it was actually in those moments where I realized that at UCL, they really understand you and, and they care and, and they are willing to help. So um, I think it's worth reminding that you have a wonderful resource in the UCL uh, alumni community um, where you can get uh, job advice and uh, networking and, and know your peers. And you can do that through the course of your studies. And also, I know it, this may seem very far away now, but you can do that also after you finish your studies. Um, and also, you have dedicated people in the student uh, support and well-being section. Uh, they can give professional advice. And also, you have wonderful mentors uh, that can guide you and, and, and basically uh, support you. And I cannot recommend this enough because I use this service myself. I have a wonderful mentor, uh, Anne, who will definitely be on the acknowledgements of my thesis because she deserves it. And, and moreover, I think it's fair to say that in every single academic department you have dedicated people who um, will give you suggestions and will orient you and it will help you uh, to make the most of your time here at UCL. And, and it was actually uh, thanks, in, in some part, thanks to them that I can be here today talking to you. Um, so just basically uh, to conclude, um, I would like to say that uh, some of the good things that happened to me in the last years, I, I kind of planned them. So I, I, I plan to do a master's and I, I plan to apply for PhDs. Um, but many others happened because I, I was in the right place at the right moment. I was moving around, so at some point I was in the right place at the right moment. And I got to know um, the right people uh, at those places and moments. Um, I cannot really speak for, for the future, uh, but I, I do think that despite the current political uncertainty these days, the London and the UCL are the right places to be. Um, I cannot just but welcome you to UCL. Uh, congratulations for making up to here. Have a wonderful, wonderful year and, and well, enjoy it. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Carmen, for sharing with us your wonderful experience as a UCL student and PhD student. Um, what can I say? In a few years, you guys will be here on stage, or at least some of you. So I guess the message that we need to take from Carmen and all the speakers today is to make the most out of every opportunities you have here at UCL. Try and do something new, meet new people, because this is, this is the time. Um, right, so next we've invited the Students' Union uh, to talk to you about uh, the wonderful events they've prepared for you this week and uh, beyond. So we have Atika, who is the Welfare and International Officer, and Jim, who is a postgraduate student uh, officer. Welcome. Hi guys, um, yep, we are from the Students' Union and we are two of your seven sabbatical officers. So my name is Artik Malik and I'm your Welfare and International Officer. And I'm Jim, I'm the Postgrad Students' Officer. Um, so we thought we'd start with a little icebreaker. So Jim will be our lovely weather girl and he's going to move across the stage and we thought, just to gauge the room and the audience, as he moves across the stage and passes your con continent or country, we thought you'd just give a little hey or shout out. Cool, I'll, I'll probably go with continents because there are way too many countries for me to point out, but please give me a yell if you're from North America. Yeah. Woo. Woo! Okay, there are a few. <laughs> South America? <Yeah. laughs> Represent, all right? Cool, cool. And all like me from Africa? Yeah. Woo! I hear you. All right, nice. How many people from Europe? Yeah. Show off. Yeah. Anyone from Asia? Yeah. There we go. Australia? Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. That's cool. And uh, am I missing any continent? Antarctica? Antarctica. <laughs> no, I'm from Antarctica. Cool. So uh, my name's Jim. I'm from the Students' Union, and I'm one of the elected representatives. So um, when you guys all enroll, all of you will automatically become members of the Students' Union, which means you will get to vote for my replacement in March. <laughs> but the Students' Union is an organization that's designed to uh, help enhance your experience here at UCL. So um, we run all kinds of events and activities, every single club, society, sports team that's run in UCL is run through the Students' Union and is run by us. We also ensure that your voice and your perspective is heard on the big stage. So if you have any concerns about your academics, about, your, um, about the facilities in your faculty, they come through us and we ensure that the university listens to them and acts upon them. So these seven people here are your sabbatical officers which were voted in, in um, March. That's me, that's Atka, and you'll get to know the rest later on. You'll see our faces. Yeah. everywhere. Um, yep, so like Jim said, uh, here at UCL, the union run all societies, clubs and societies. So um, obviously you guys are all here for your degrees, um, but in reality, I think what makes your experience here isn't going to be your degree. It's going to be everything you do outside of your degree. It'll be the people you meet, the activities you do, like the experiences you have. And for me, I think the best way I made friends was joining societies. I went to lots of kind of um, Freshers Week events, I went to a lot of socials, and it was really just through that that I met people that were like me. Um, so we have more than 300 different clubs and societies here, and more than 12,000 students that get involved in clubs and societies, so it's just a way for you to find things that you like, and there's something for everyone with as little or as much as you want to commit to you, from like we heard chocolate tasting society, to Harry Potter society, to, I don't know. Anything. Anything really. Pole dancing. Um, yeah, Vibosa. pole dancing. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a good way to keep <laughs> fit, guys. Um, but yeah, they're all listed on our website, so do check out the union website to see, and also in the coming few weeks, there will be a lot of taster sessions, so make sure you can drop into those. Um, there's all, we also have a Give It A Go program, which is kind of like uh, one-off trips and events for people that don't want to commit to a club or society. But yeah, there's something for everyone. Grant. So next up is Team UCL. 
Now, Team UCL is, our, um, is the brand for all, for all our sports teams. So if you're a UCL student, you definitely support Team UCL. By force. And sports is a phenomenal way to get involved in UCL life. For instance, me, while I was here, well, while I am here, I'm still a student, technically. Um, I am part of American football and Bubble Sock, which is a powerlifting. And it's a great space for you to get to meet students with common interests, to socialize and really enhance your social network. Um, also, it's a great way to keep active. And um, also, we run a gym, which is the cheapest gym for students in London. It's Bloomsbury Fitness. It's at the third floor of Bloomsbury Theatre. And it's uh, phenomenal. We have women's only sessions on uh, Wednesday mornings and Sunday mornings. And uh, we, important to note, we accommodate any skill level. So if it's a sport you're just vaguely interested in and you love to give it a go, this is your chance to. If it's something that you're an expert in already and you compete on a national level, we would love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yep, so like Jim said, we have a gym. We have two gyms. We have a gym and an actual gym. Um, uh, we run classes at the gym, which are all professionally run, and you can buy monthly membership, three monthly membership, six monthly membership, um, if you want to stay fit and keep fit. We also have lots of places on campus for you, from cafes to bars, um, and these are just kind of like places around campus for you to socialize, study, relax. Um, I think for me, I did history as an undergrad, so um, we had a common room, but it didn't always want to be in my department, so there's just a lot of places on campus if you fancy a change. Um, but yeah, it's also good to note that all the union cafes that we run, all the money that they get, it then goes back into supporting societies, supporting the union, and supporting stuff that you guys will then be able to utilize, basically. Um, we also have a range of things available for help and support, but mainly it's the advice service, which is located on 25 Gordon Street, and it's basically just the go-to place. Um, if you have anything that happens to you from, or any kind of issues from like housing issues to budgeting to sickness, homesickness, um, academic issues, um, the advice service is the go-to place. Um, and all the meetings are confidential, they'll take place with a trained advisor, so yeah, don't knock that, it's definitely a good service to use. Um, they also offer peer support programs for anybody who feels that English isn't their first language. For non-native English speakers, there's language and writing support for one-off workshops, one-on-one -on -one conversations. But yeah, definitely check out the advice service. Cool. London. If you chose to come to UCL, you chose to come to London. And London is the most incredible, intense, dynamic, and phenomenal city in the entire world. It is... It's the cheapest place for you to get to see Hamilton. <laughs> it's, um, there's so many museums you can go to, so many theatre shows, and really, I really want to encourage you to try and embrace the experience of living in London. And one of the best ways of doing that is volunteering. Now, over the past year, we had over 2,100 students contribute over 64,000 hours of volunteering. And it's a great way to immerse yourself in your local community. You could end up doing things like uh, organizing social events for the elderly or uh, running sports um, events for disabled um, children. It's a great way to immerse yourself. And the best way to get involved is to speak to our volunteering services. Now, this is at 25 Gordon Street, which would have been pointed out to you if you've done one of our campus tours. If you haven't, they're still running across the week. And um, yeah, just pop up to the first floor and speak to someone there, and they'll be able to give you an activity that you would love and would help you really discover what London has to offer. Yep, so like Jim said, there are loads of events running from campus tours, IKEA trips. Um, I believe that there is a boat party happening tonight, so definitely get your tickets to have a nice cruise along the River Thames. And we also have the uh, Pongathon. He really Which wants is, to say uh, Pongathon, guys. If you he really like ping pong. pong, it's a thing <laughs> at the marquee. I may be there. Um, <laughs> there is also the Freshers um, Welcome Fair on the 28th and 29th of September. Definitely make sure to um, pop in. That's where we have all 300 clubs and societies. They will all have a stall. You'll be able to walk around, sign up to anything you like. Um, and it's just like a place for you to see everything that's available for you to get involved in. Um, Cool. So, yeah. so next up is UCL Hacks. This is uh, where I get to uh, maybe give you a few tips about stuff that might help improve your experience here a little bit. Um, let's see. Free food. So there tends to be free lunch every day in front of the SOAS Library or the Student Central. Um, it's run by the Hare Krishna Society. It's really good. Options for vegans as well, so you should go. 
Everyone loves free food. Um, we also have, um, if you happen to bring your own food from home, we have numerous microwaves on campus. There's a map on our website which will show you where all the microwaves are located. So you can uh, go microwave your food. Um, I've already mentioned the women's only gym sessions. And perhaps the most important hack, if you ever have any questions at any time, feel free to contact us on any of the contact details on the next slide. There. And uh, email us if you wish. But yeah, keep in contact. Um, follow the Instagram to see anything that's kind of going on. And as I said, the seven sabbatical officers are here for you to represent your needs. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That's it. Um, okay, so we are now going to move over to our um, Global Ambassador Q&A panel. So I'd like to invite our four Global Ambassadors up to the stage, please. Um, and our Global Ambassadors are UCL students who are either international students themselves, like you guys are, or they are UCL students who've been abroad on the study abroad programme, or in some cases both, which is very helpful. Um, so can you help me uh, welcome our Ambassadors to the stage, please? <laughs> And I'll just ask you guys quickly to introduce yourselves. Um, hi guys, I'm Rob. I'm from the UK. I'm a final year philosophy, politics and economics student. And last year I was fortunate enough to study at the University of Sydney in Australia. Hi guys, I'm Tara. I'm from the US. And I study modern languages, Spanish and Italian. And I did my study abroad in Spain and Italy. Hi, my name is Catherine and I'm from China. Um, I study BA Linguistics, I'm in my last year. And I'm also from UCL Writers Society, check us out. Um, and I'm a uh, diehard Slytherin. <laughs> uh, my name is Indre, I'm from Malaysia. And I'm in my final year of Experimental Linguistics. Okay, brilliant, thank you guys. So, we want to give, um, sorry, was everyone gonna clap then? We can clap again if you like. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, so we'd like to give you the chance now to ask our ambassadors some questions. And we know that asking a question in a room this big can be a bit daunting. So what we've done is set up um, an online kind of forum that you can ask questions. We will be uh, picking out the questions on the iPad at the front here. And we'll try and get through as many of them as possible uh, during the Q&A session. So if you are already on the Wi-Fi, do feel free um, to go onto Slido again. You'll need to enter the code 1247, which is just in red on the screen. Um, you can select questions, then you can ask questions. Um, what we would ask is that you have a few minutes just to chat with those around you, come up with a question, and then do feel free to submit it. And as I said, we'll go through them um, when we begin the Q&A panel. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to um, log on to Slido and start submitting your questions. Um, as I said, these will be coming through on the iPad at the front, so we will try and um, bring as many of your questions in as possible. What we've also done is uh, we've picked out some questions that we know are always very popular, so we'll start off with those ones and then we'll feed your questions in um, when we are able to. So we're going to start with some questions about life at UCL. The first question we've got is, and I'll pass it over to you guys, um, how did you go about settling into an institution which is as large as UCL is? I'd say definitely join a club or a society because we have over 200 clubs and societies. Um, I'm on the rowing society and I highly recommend that to anyone considering doing a sport 
just because it's a really cool sport and we have the best socials. Um, I actually joined the Canadian Society in my first year just because I couldn't find the American Society. <laughs> and um, I thought, well, Canada close enough, so make sure you join our society. <laughs> I'd also say probably um, what's really good is to just make sure you find your bearings around UCL, go for a few walks and on your first few days here. Uh, make sure you know where all your classes are and um, where all the key parts of campus are, libraries and things like that. And it'll just mean that everything's that little bit easier when, um, as the term progresses. And also, well, because you see us so big, don't foe, don't it. Actually, it just means there's a higher chance to find someone who is a bit like you, who shares your hobbies and shares your political opinions, maybe, and etc. So you will definitely find someone to hang up with. Cool. Okay. We've got um, a few questions from the audience. Uh, what's the difference between a lecture, a seminar, a tutorial, and a practical? Oh, is anyone brave I enough? actually answer that question in the morning. <laughs> so yeah, um, lecture is like more um, structured, where like the professors they have planned it before. I mean, they, they should plan their seminars, etc. As well, but like lecture is just more structured, and then it would be a hall of maybe not this many people, but it will be a large class, and then yeah. Um, for tutorials, it's much smaller groups. For example, for uh, linguistics, we've got like usually 40 people in, that's in the whole year, in a lecture, but 10 people in a um, tutorial. And in tutorial, it's more like a focus group where the professor would probably focus on um, a few questions that he knows would confuse people in the lecture. And then it's your chance to get in-depth conversations with the professor and these 10 people, you would discuss a lot of questions, etc. So it's less structured, but like more supposed to be helping you should you find anything confusing in class. But lots of the tutorials, like it depends on your professor. There's no set rule about how a tutorial or a seminar should run. Um, I have a few seminars, like creative writing ones. They are just like lectures, like they are the smaller scale, but they are just like lectures. So. Yeah, I guess that's the difference. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that for seminars, there are smaller groups and professors, some professors tend to like ask questions, so make sure you do your readings beforehand if you don't want to be put on the spot and it's really embarrassing. And I think practicals are just for maybe science students, they go in the lab and do like experiments. Brilliant, thanks guys. Any more questions from the audience? Um, yes, so when and how can you meet your personal tutor? Your department will let you know. Your teaching administrator will be sending out information to tell you who your personal tutor is. Next week, there will be meet your department, um, and you will definitely be able to know from the beginning. Or there's also transitory mentor who are senior students to help you. So apart from your personal tutor, uh, transitory mentors are also a great point of contact if you have any questions. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to the next question now. Um, what advice, guys, would you give to students here who are about to begin at UCL, and do you have any insider tips? I would say check out the UCL webpage. It actually has a lot, a lot of information. Just go in, there are like different departments, different tabs, different links. Click into that, scheme through the information. Sometimes you get some insider news. And if you follow UCL on all the social media, um, social media channels, you actually get to know about what's happening on campus. So that's very useful, especially when we have like a huge institution. It's hard to know like what's happening in each department. I'd just say there's so much at UCL that you can do no matter what your interest is. It, it's, it's got such a wide variety of things that you could possibly achieve and um, it, it's virtually impossible to complete UCL. So no matter what you do, try not to waste your time. I know there's a lot of great stuff on at the minute, but try not to stay, on, stay in your room on Netflix and things like that, just because there's so much that you could possibly do at UCL, um, and just make the most of it. Um, anyone knows what the difference is between a society and a club? And since we're talking about it, do you pay memberships? societies? Yes, so um, you have to pay membership for societies. 
Um, not that we want to get money out of you like for any evil purposes, but because we have to run the society with money and the, the grant money is fixed and we count on non-grant money, especially sports clubs, like they charge you high, not because they want to, but it's expensive to get like facilities and to book space and etc. So yeah, that's about the membership bit. I don't know about the difference between clubs and society. Anyone? Um, there isn't much of a difference. The only difference is that like sports clubs tend to be clubs, not societies. Like the boat club, the the swimming society, though. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it really varies. Um, yeah. So like the hockey club, that's also a club, but there's really not much difference. But like, make sure you join a society. We have a huge variety. We have the chocolate society the Beyonce Appreciation Society, that sort of thing. Um, so make sure you check them out. Um, there are also like some society that are free and some membership fees are just like three pounds per year. So it's not too much. And there's a broke society. They've changed their name to Personal Finance Society. But like, yeah, the idea is the same. <laughs> so they help with managing like finance and budgeting like that. Okay, um, so we're going to move on to questions about London now. Who, who is here in London for the first time? Okay, so a few. So it's obviously very different being in London as a tourist as it is to being a real, a real Londoner like you guys are now. Um, but we've got a little bit of information for you about life in London, uh, including our first question about travel. Best ways, in your opinion, to travel around London? really recommend getting the Oyster card. Um, if you do, there's a student card, which um, you can, if, if you're also looking at traveling around the UK a, li a little bit more, the best possible purchase you could make is the 16 to 25 rail card or the 26 to 30 rail card, depending on your, on your age. I, I couldn't recommend that more. You can also link your rail card to your Oyster card and you'll get like discounts on tubes. And about the student Oyster card, it's like only do it if you plan to um, get a monthly travel card. Because if you get a student um, Oyster card, let me see if it's in my pocket. Um, I mean, if you get it, then like you will have a discount. I think it's 30% off for your uh, monthly travel card, which would allow you to travel between zone one and zone two. That's the most popular choice. Of course, there's also two zone three, zone four, etc. Um, but if you are doing pay as you go, or if you really just want to stay in zone one, which we don't recommend, then um, you don't have to get a student Oyster card. A student Oyster card would look something like that. It will have your picture on it, and yeah, etc. Apply as early as possible. Um, I personally don't have an Oyster card just because I was too lazy to get one. So like, if you have a contactless <laughs> card, that works well too. Um, and I definitely recommend downloading City Mapper because that works much better than Google Maps. Great, thank you guys. So just um, a little bit of essential information here. So some of this has already been covered, but obviously you may well be very familiar with forms of transport in London. Some of them are very iconic, the, the Tube and the London buses. Um, in terms of the Tube, you, can't, uh, you are not able to pay with cash anymore, I believe, so you will need to use your contactless credit or debit card, um, or the Oyster cards that have been mentioned before. And we'll talk a little bit more about the student Oyster card in a second. Um, there are also night tubes now, which are a fairly recent addition in London. So if you are out late at night, you don't always have to rely on taxis. It's a much more convenient way to travel home during the weekend. Um, buses, again, no cash payments, but you are able to take advantage of the hopper fare, which uh, allows you to take any number of buses within a one hour period, and you're only charged once. So if you're just making a few uh, short journeys around central London, this can be a really good option. Um, some of the bu bus routes around London are also very scenic as well, so you're actually seeing more on a bus than you would be on the tube. Uh, cycling in London, we have a kind of cycling in London has improved, I think, over the last few years. It's, it's becoming a bit more safe. Um, however, if you've kind of been on Euston Road or Tottenham Court Road or any of the major roads around here, you'll see that the traffic is fairly crazy. So if you are planning to cycle, please do be careful. Please make sure that you wear a helmet. Um, if you're not buying a bike or not thinking about purchasing one, you can hire one through the um, Santander cycle scheme, 
which you may have seen some of the docking stations that are around. It's just the kind of big rows of bikes that you can just hire for a short-term period. Um, and there are lots of docking stations around London. So if you're just going from A to B and it's a relatively small journey, you can um, hire one for a short period of time for quite cheap. Um, I think we've already mentioned Transport for London, but all of the, if you're really new to London and you're just not really sure where to start, the Transport for London app uh, or website is probably the best place to begin. It's just above our heads here on the screen if, you can, um, if you're able to take a picture. And you're able to compare fares and work out the best mode of transport for the journey that you're taking. Okay, so a little bit about the student Oyster card. You guys have already mentioned um, about it. Again, just some essential information for those of you who might be keen to purchase one. Um, as I think Catherine mentioned, it's really worth kind of working out whether buying the Oyster card is right for you. So if you know that you'll be making very regular journeys, so you'll be travelling the same types of journey every day, um, and you'll be buying a month, a weekly or a monthly travel card, then it may be worth purchasing the student Oyster card. Um, however, if you plan on walking or you're, you don't live very far from campus, you don't think you'll be making many journeys, it may not be worth you buying it. So it's really dependent on your personal circumstances. Um, it's essentially a photo card that will allow you to get money off the weekly and monthly travel cards. And you have to apply for it online. Um, it costs £20 to apply for and you need to upload a picture of yourself. So again, it's worth working out whether that £20 payment will be beneficial to you and whether you will make a saving. Um, in terms of eligibility, you have to be enrolled on a full-time status, which I assume the majority of you will be, um, and you do need to have a London address. You can only apply once you've enrolled as well. So once you've enrolled later this week, you can then make the application as soon as you've done that. Um, and you have to be here for a minimum of 14 weeks, but that will be fine for you. Um, if you've got any kind of, if you're unsure about how to apply or want to find out more, we've included the website up there as well. That takes you straight to the photo card application. Okay, so on to money now, a really hot topic. Um, how do you guys manage your money and budget as a student? And do you have any uh, tips on student discounts? Um, what I would say is, we've already mentioned it, the rail card's the best purchase you could make. Besides that, um, in terms of student discounts, at the moment, because it's Freshers Week, well, Freshers Week is, is coming up, lots of different shops and stores and restaurants will have student discounts available because they'll, they'll know there's a lot of new students coming. So just if, you, if you're in doubt that there is a student discount anywhere, just show your UCL ID because it might pay off and you might save a little bit of money. There's also this Uni Days app that you can download where you can get discounts on like shopping or food. And also don't always calculate how much this item is in your home currency. In case your home currency is, say, Chinese RMB, it's like eight, eight yuan is like one pound and you'd find everything super expensive, which is extra stress. So yeah, just forget about the home currency. <laughs> So speaking about managing money, um, we have quite a few questions about uh, getting a job and internships. Okay, f first, first of all, uh, is it easy to get a, an, inter an internship or a job, a part-time job as a student? So I think it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, about part-time jobs, there's a student union website called uh, Student Union Job Shop. You could check these out. On that website, there's usually like lots of UCO centrally managed jobs. For example, you could work as a barista in the UCO cafe, or you could work as a UCO classroom monitor checker, or you could work in the UCO museum as a fish tank cleaner. So yeah, these are popular jobs. Um, and also, if you're looking for um, internships, it, it depends on what industry you're interested in. I know I've got some friends who do, I think, vaguely business related, and they start applying a year ago. Like she's saying, oh, next summer, I'm going to have some internships. I was like, wow. But if you're looking for a publishing, um, like publishers don't start looking for interns until the very last minute. Okay, that might be a bit exaggerating, but they are not as in a hurry as business people are. So depends. And it really depends on what transferable skills you have. 
Like, so yeah, get as much work experience as you can, involve, get involved with clubs and societies. If you're in a committee, that's something great to put on to your CV. And even if you get a job that, for example, if you're applying to a publisher and you did some part-time job as a barista, you could tell them, well, I've got good um, communication skills and they would love it. So yeah, don't worry about what experience you have. As long as you've learned something from your experience, your employer would cherish it. Okay, so related to that, I'm going to read this out because it's very interesting. So I'm interested in taking a job or an internship, but I fear it may interfere with my studies during my first year. So how do you manage that, having a job and studying? Um, it's difficult because I actually had two jobs in my first year and I felt like the workload was just overwhelming. Um, so make sure you talk to your employer first and just say that like, um, I'm a student um, who's full-time enrolled and um, I can only work like a specific like amount of hours per week. Just like mentioned beforehand, you can definitely like work and study if you like manage your time well. And for internships, I would strongly recommend you do it in summer rather than um, during term time. And also just a tip for all of you on tier four visa, um, you can't exceed 20 hours per week, no matter it's paid work or unpaid work. So yeah, don't break the laws. <laughs> but you don't have a limit during summer? Yeah, no, as long as it's out of term time. Okay, so make sure you check your own visa requirements or speak to the tier four team first, okay? Brilliant. Um, so just to wrap up some of that information, the, uh, the NUS Extra card, which is also now called Totem, uh, is the official student ID card. Um, you might want to consider buying this. You can buy it for a year for £12 or for three years for £32. Um, it allows you to access loads of discounts across London and across the UK um, in restaurants and bars and shops and events as well. Um, and it also comes with the International Student Identity Card on the back. So if you are traveling outside of the UK whilst you're here, if you're planning to travel during vacation time, it also then opens up uh, access to European and further uh, discounts overseas. Um, although, as Rob said, sometimes you can just use your UCL ID card as a kind of student confirmation. So if you're not sure about whether to get the NUS card, maybe see how you get on with your ID card, and that may well be enough. Um, there are lots of good deals to be had, as has already been mentioned, particularly during this start of time season. Um, if you've, I mean, it looks like everyone's got their phones already, but if you um, have come to the UK and you're looking for a new handset or um, a new SIM card, it really just pays to do some research. Um, you are pretty much in the same boat as anyone else in the UK looking for a uh, a new phone deal. There's really good deals to be had, but you do need to shop around. Um, on Tottenham Court Road, which is the main kind of shopping street near campus, you can find branches of most of the biggest mobile phone providers. So it's worth just having a look online, going into the shops and discussing what their best deals are. Um, other student discounts, um, Student Beans and the Uni Days website are also really good sources of uh, information for um, upcoming events and student discounts as well. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just remember that UCL Careers exists and functions very well. So if you're interested in jobs, like go to UCL Careers and they've got lots of information online, they've got one-to-one -one service, etc. Check it out. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I think we've pretty much covered all of this. But yeah, say the student, if you're living independently this year, so if you're not living in a UCL residence and you're paying your own bills, um, we'd recommend having a look at the Save the Student website, which allows you to compare uh, co the cost of bills. And you can obviously sometimes get quite a good saving on, on the cost of your overall bill cost. Um, so that's worth having a look at as well. Okay, guys, your one top thing to do in London... Um, I definitely say go watch a musical theatre because we're in London and it's like the heart of West End musicals. They basically have shows, theatres every day happening and it's like, um, so you can get like day tickets if you line up like super early in the morning at the box office. You can get like fun seats for like £20 or um, Matilda is for £5. 
And if you go for rush tickets, which is like maybe 30 minutes before door, doors open, you can also get like cheap tickets. There's also like this um, West End Musical Festival happening in summer. That is like free entry, and they actually get some um, like different musicals to actually perform their songs. So I definitely recommend that. I would uh, add to that, you could also check out Shakespeare's Globe. They've got standing tickets really cheap. Um, and actually, um, my top thing to do is bookshops. There's a lot of bookshops around in London. The biggest, like, chains, Waterstones. Um, we also have foyos and a lot of independent bookshops. And, like, there's themed bookshops. Um, and also second-hand bookshops. Um, and also libraries, etc. London's very rich in literature culture. And also check out museums, lots of them are free and are very worth going. I'd say um, Camden's really good, so make sure you go check it out. Um, Camden Market is very popular among students. And also Winter Wonderland, which is basically like a Christmas fair, is held in Hyde Park, one of the biggest parks in London. And it's open from November till the first week of January. <clears throat> yep, and if there's um, any sports fans amongst you guys, um, if you get out to Stratford, that's where the Olympic, the Olympic Park is. You can look around the London Stadium, there's where the velodrome was, there's the Aquatic Centre. Um, that's really cool to go to. Uh, for anybody who's interested in Premier League football, I, uh, I think there's a few Americans in the room, so you'll no doubt incorrectly call it soccer. Um, but but it's, uh, it's okay because you're here for an education, so it's okay. But, um, <laughs> But, um, but, but nevertheless, if you're interested, in, if you want to go to a Premier League football game in London, probably the best bet is to look at tickets for West Ham. Um, to be honest, it's because they can't fill the stadium, but that's the reason. <laughs> but um, but if, yeah, if you want to go see a Premier League football game, try and get West Ham tickets. That's probably the best bet. Oh, brilliant. Um, so coming back on campus. On oh, <laughs> um, What's your favourite place uh, to study in? at UCL. What's my your favourite library? Yeah, my, so, so, my favourite place is the um, School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies. It's on, um, I think it's on, it's, it's just behind, um, just by Tavistock Square, and it's a really lovely library, I'd recommend it. My top space will be at Chandler House. It's a bit off campus, so that's why you don't get the crowd. But you don't want all students coming in to take our space. <laughs> It's a linguistics library, but actually in UCL you could access all libraries. I was joking. Like, it doesn't matter what you study, you could go into any library and people won't really kick you out. Like, don't worry about that. Um, my favourite spot would be the Italian section in the main library. I don't speak Italian, I don't know why, but it's a great place. But the actual, like, quiet spot in the main, uh, main library is the Jewish section, like the... Um, yeah, Jewish studies, they've got a very lovely uh, reading room and everybody who studies maths, physics, tend to go there and yeah, it's usually quiet. Sorry. I prefer the Senate House Library because it's really quiet. Um, I don't really want to tell you guys because now you're all going to go. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's really quiet because the main library is always so packed, you can't really find a seat there. So. And I think the most popular place will be the New Student Centre. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen it, it's a new building, like five stories, and it's open 24 hours, but it's like really, really packed, unless you go in the midnight like me. <laughs> there's also, got, oh sorry, there's also a rooftop garden in the new student centre, so it's quite, check it out, lovely. Yeah. I was about to say they've got noisy study areas, where they call it social study areas, so if you don't want to study in the quiet room, then it's great to go to the student centre, they've got yeah, lots of social study spaces where you could discuss with your friends. Okay, so whilst we are on the, we are on the topic of studying, um, how many hours do you need to spend on studying every week in order to get a good grade? Well, it depends on <laughs> when your deadlines are, because that's when you study the most. <laughs> I think it really depends on like different people. So I'm the kind of like deadline fighter people. But I think you really need to work out whether like what type of like studier you are because like some people can't really function well if the deadline is coming close, but that's when I function well. 
So I would suggest looking at your pr uh, professor's syllabus. They will give you like an information sheet where they tell you when, uh, how, how long time they expect or friendly advise you to study for their module. Uh, use that as a guideline if you really want to know how many hours you want to spend. But don't limit yourself to that. Like, know what's the best for you because it doesn't matter how many hours you study. What matters is if you have comprehended what the professor talks about in class. So if you only need two hours, that's fine. And if you need 12 hours, that's also fine. Like, yeah, just as long as the quality is there, the quantity doesn't matter. Okay, brilliant. So we're actually jumping a little bit, but just to go back onto lunch, things to do with lunch. So once you've done all of your studying, you've spent hours and hours in the library, a few things to do outside <laughs> of UCL. Um, so we've mentioned a few of uh, the ambassador's favorite things to do in London. It, I mean, it kind of goes without saying, but there is so much to do in London. Um, a really good place to look for upcoming events is Time Out magazine and website, and you may well have Time Out in your own um, home cities. Um, it's a free magazine that you can pick up from tubes, tube and train stations on a, I think, kind of a Tuesday and Wednesday morning, um, and it gives you an overview of all of the events, free events and food events and pop-up events that are happening in London during that week. Um, so it's a really good idea to have a look for that. The Visit London website is also really good for discounted uh, theatre tickets and free events as well. In terms of activities, we don't really need to talk about this one too much, but there is loads and loads to do. Um, as a student, make sure that you are taking advantage of things like cheap cinema tickets. Cinemas can be fairly expensive in central London if you're going during the weekend, but sometimes if you go during the week um, or during the daytime, if you have a spare couple of hours between lectures, um, you can often get really discounted tickets. And a lot of use, uh, London's museums, as has already been mentioned, are free. So they're a really good opportunity to see, and a lot of them are based very locally to UCL. Okay, so we're a bit late for lunch, but maybe tomorrow or dinner. Um, some of the top tips for places to eat at UCL. UCL campus has loads of places that you can eat. So if you don't have a lot of time um, in between lectures, you can grab something on campus. Your top tips for places to eat, guys. The, uh, around Euston Station, there's quite a few areas. There's um, Rosie King is a, f a very popular Malaysian restaurant around there, which is popular with students. There's also um, Sainsbury's and a few cafes around there, which I recommend. I would recommend the refectory. It's based in main campus. Um, the refectory offers like main courses, hot food. It sounds posh, but it's actually cheap. You could get five pounds and get like a nice dish like chicken katsu curry or like fried chicken wings, that's even cheaper. And like Lebanese food, pan-European food. They also have the light grab-and-go options and soup and fruit and yogurt, sweets. Just check um, Refectory out. Yeah, and so, um, there are some student union cafes which are relatively cheap as well. And in this building itself, there's a cafe on for floor reception. I'm sure all of you guys have seen that. But, that, but there's also another cafe in level six which is a little less known, so it might be not that crowded. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant, thank you guys. Um, so a couple of suggestions uh, that are very local, so just off campus, but still really close by. Some of you may well have already been to the Brunswick Centre, which is really near to this building. It's about a five minute walk from here. Um, it's a kind of undercover sort of uh, shopping centre area. There's got, there are clothes shops and a, a supermarket um, and also lots of the really popular kind of fast food chains um, uh, in London are based there. It's also a good place to go and get a coffee. Um, Tottenham Court Road, as we mentioned, has got loads of shops on it but also lots of eateries. Um, it's particularly good if you're based on main campus. It's just about a five minute walk from there. There are also lots of branches or kind of convenience branches of local supermarkets as well. And suggestion three, which has already been made, is the UCL refectory. This is based really in the heart of campus, so it's just, um, just down kind of off the main quad, um, and it's open during the week for lots of lunchtime and kind of breakfast options as well. I think they actually open for dinner as well, at dinner? least last year. Okay, yeah. brilliant. So, so yeah, so if you're on campus a little bit later, you can also grab something without having to go off campus. Okay. So any other questions from the iPad that we haven't already covered? Yeah, so we have quite a few. We have a couple for 
um, related to study abroad. So I think Claire, oh, me and you have made brilliant. a very good impression. <laughs> and hopefully Rob will help us um, answer. And Tara went abroad as well, right? Um, so in what year do you apply to study abroad? Um, in your second year, that's when we started. Yes, yeah, your second year. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it depends on your degree programme, but yeah, for most students, it's you'll apply in your second year to then go abroad in your third year. There are some exceptions. Um, we have actually got, and we will be circulating information shortly about our study abroad info sessions, which will be starting uh, in the second week of October. So even though you're first year, you wouldn't be applying now. Um, but if you're super keen to find out more about studying abroad, you've already, you've already done London, you've been here for a few days, and you're already looking to go somewhere else, um, you can come along and have a chat with our team, and we'll tell you more about how the study abroad programme works so that you can be extra prepared when you then come to apply in your second year. And uh, second one, still about uh, studying abroad. Uh, how do I apply to study abroad as an international student? Are there any visa restrictions that I need to be aware of? Um, it depends on what country you're from. For me, obviously, because I'm American, I had to apply for um, a visa for Spain and a visa for Italy, and it's such a pain, but like you have to do it. <laughs> it's just the law. Yeah, so again, it's very dependent on your own uh, nationality and as Tara said, where you're going. Um, if you're here on a Tier 4 visa, so you're here in London on Tier 4, you can go abroad. Your Tier 4 visa will be kind of suspended for the year in which you're abroad, but we provide lots of resources in the years before you go away um, to, to help you with that process. And also, just to remind you, um, we have a variety of short-term programmes which are a bit more flexible, so they take place um, mainly in the summer, so outside the academic term time. They bear no credits, but it's still a good experience to have on your CV. And they're all over the world. And usually the visa application or the implications for that is, uh, is a lot lower, so it's a lot less complicated. Okay, um, someone asked, uh, what's the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> um, so now I'm just having a look and I see people still have the handouts that they came in with. Um, basically, um, you just use your username at ucl.ac.uk and put in your password that you've selected for yourself. And you connect to EduRoam, so that's the Wi-Fi that we use here. Um, was it difficult for you guys to find friends when you started at UCL and how did you go about it? No, there's, there's, I think there's about 40,000 students at UCL, so there's, there's definitely going to be like-minded people in the university. The way to read them out, I think a great way is societies. I'm on the Swimming Society, um, if, you know, which is a great place for meeting people, and there's loads of societies, um, and also your course mates as well. You're studying the same thing as them so that you're doubtless going to have things in common with them. I would love to promote Writer Society again, but instead of that, I'm going to say um, find people that live next door if you're living in a student residence hall. Like, especially if it's catered, attend dinners, sit with different people. That's how you might meet your, um, I wouldn't say love of your life, but, <laughs> you know, I actually, I met mine. Um, and <laughs> you might meet your good friends. Uh, importantly, you might meet the people you want to share flat with when you move out of the UCL halls next year. So yeah, take the opportunity when you're in residence halls. I think also especially in like freshers week, like these two weeks, uh, it's a time where you actually can meet people outside your department. Because once you start course, you might only just get to see people in your department. So you really want to take the opportunity now to meet like different friends. So, how many societies are too many? <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on what society it is, because I know drama, musical theatre, opera, obviously if you want to um, get involved, be ready for a big commitment. Um, they, they have smaller scale shows, but usually if you want to be involved in the grand shows, you need to really um, rehearse a lot. And so I wouldn't suggest you signing up for something else. Um, like for sports, I think there's competitive and there's non-competitive teams. And like if you're competitive, I assume you train a lot. And for um, Chocolate Society, Beyonce Appreciation Society, 
writer society or like art society, photography, etc. I think they are more chill and you could go to a session when you have the time and not to go when you don't. And yeah, check it out with your specific society and uh, make sure you meet your deadlines. If you meet your deadlines, then you're probably okay with the amount of societies. I personally think one society is enough, or maybe two maximum, but like I joined the rowing and the hockey society and that was just way too much. Um, so once, once enough, because they hold socials every week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how can I learn a, an extra language at UCL? Oh, go to CLE. That's the Center for Language and International Education. Yeah, so you might be able to sign up for a course like German um, as part of your degree, but you need to check your course structure online if your course allows you to choose an elective. Um, but otherwise, you could do it as an evening course. They provide discounts for students at UCL. Um, there are also like some societies like UCL Japanese Society that runs like language classes every week. Okay, a few more academic related questions if you've got time. Um, what are the purpose of reading weeks and are there exams afterwards? <coughs> They are technically used for reading, to catch up um, on readings, but like people normally just use them for um, meeting their deadlines, writing their essays. So some people might just use that week, but technically you should be using like more than one week to write like a 2,500 word essay. And yeah. a lot of people, sorry. Yeah. And a lot of people just go traveling as well. I go traveling. <laughs> yeah, often, often in reading weeks, you might have a deadline the week after, so it is useful to do some work. But also in, in reading weeks, um, many societies hold different events where you might go for a, a, a trip, like the Swimming Society, we often go to Sheffield for a, for a, a competition in reading week and things like that, so um, yeah, yeah. About exams, it really depends on your department. So while I go traveling, my best friend who does engineering and my partner who does astrophysics, they have exams. So yeah, if you're studying those, be prepared. It really depends on your, um, your course. Some certain departments, I think, might also um, suggest you to revise because they've got exams coming up, but I haven't really heard about that. Like what I've heard is mostly exam during that week. So yeah, department specific. Great, and don't forget that you will find out lots more about how your own department works when you have your induction in the next few days or next week. So that's when you'll really get a sense of the exam timetable and course lists and reading lists and things like that. Um, so I think that's probably all of the time that we have for questions now. Could you help uh, us in thanking our Global Ambassadors? <laughs> and our Global Ambassadors will be uh, based in the Student Inquiry Centre, which we've mentioned, the Student Centre, uh, for the rest of this week and next week. So if you have any other questions that come to you after this session, and we imagine there will be lots, do feel free to stop by and see them. Um, so, before you head off, we just wanted to say a huge thank you for um, taking the time to stay with us this afternoon. Um, don't forget that you can use Ask UCL to find out lots of kind of quick-fire questions about things at UCL. Enjoy the rest of this week. Make sure that you enrol, that's really important. Make sure that you make the most of all of the social events that are happening. Um, and enjoy your time at UCL. Thank you very much.